Hi, so welcome to Radical Expressions and Equations. This is our first lesson online. Um, I'll try and go slow, but remember you can always stop and replay. <laughs> I know for some of you I go very, very quickly. Um, so let's see what happens. This is Mrs. Finley's key. Um, and it's for blocks one and three. And it is math 20-1, and we are in March 2020. Okay, so we're talking about radical expressions and equations. First thing we're gonna talk about is we're going to just do a little reviewing of our radicals from math 10C. And we learned all that stuff about uh, exponent laws, and you use them a lot in this unit. So first of all, here looking at uh, what is a radical. Well, here's an example. This whole thing would be a radical. If we look at the parts, this value right here is our index. And this value right here is the radicand. I will try to use those terms as much as possible. Um, to get us familiar with them. Uh, referring to the index a lot, a lot of the times when we're dealing with these, we're gonna be dealing with an index of two because we're looking at square roots, but sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're looking at cubed roots or fourth roots or fifth roots, etc. And understanding how radicals work will help us do that. Uh, it all comes down to the basics of a square root though. And if you just extrapolate some of those rules, um, uh, it should be okay. So reviewing our uh, exponent laws. Uh, first one, anything to the power of one is itself. So x to the power of one equals x. So similarly, six to the power of one is equal to six. Um, anything uh, to the power of zero is equal to this is, I, I pause with my 10 C's all the time and they all shout out one. Anything to the power of zero is equal to one. So X to the power of zero equals one. Similarly, seven to the power of zero equals one. Uh, when we have negative exponents, um, so for example, X to the negative one, we would write that as the reciprocal of that. So X to the negative one would be one over X. Four to the negative one would be one over four. Um, my, uh, I often talk about a train ticket. The negative sign's a train ticket that gets you to the other platform. Um, once you cash in your ticket, it's gone. So similarly, you can move a negative exponent. If you have it on the bottom of a fraction, can move to the top as well if you want to make it positive. We always say simplest form means positive exponents. So keep that in mind when you get into uh, simplifying complicated um, exponents that you want always want them to have positive exponents. Then we look at some of our other laws. Um, we have the product rule. If you have two um, uh, exponents multiplied by each other and they have the same base, we add the exponents. So x to the m times x to the n becomes x to the m plus n. Uh, similarly, here's an example, x to the 2 times x to the 3 would be x to the 2 plus 3, or x to the 5. You can add those together. Uh, quotient law for dividing, it's the opposite of multiplying. So what's the opposite of addition? Subtraction. So x to the m over x to the n will be x to the m minus n. And here's an example, x to the six over x to the two would be x to the six minus two or x to the four. Then we have the power of a power law. And basically what that means is we've got one power, our exponent x to the m, and it is brought to another exponent n. And what we do there is we multiply, that's, uh, we multiply the exponents. So x to the m all brought to the power of n would be x to the m times n. Uh, an example here, x to the 2 to the power of 3 would be x to the 2 times 3 or x to the 6. 
Now, the next little box is basically talking about the distributed property. If we have that outside, that n is outside the x, y, we need to bring it in and we need to distribute it to each of the terms inside the bracket. Um, similarly, when it's a quotient as well, we just need to make sure that we have distributed it to everything that is in the brackets, okay? Um, and this is a little add-on to the negative exponent. Sometimes your negative exponent might have a value. It's not just always a negative one. It might be a negative four or a negative three. And that value travels once you move it to the reciprocal. Um, it, it travels with that base. So, uh, for example, x to the minus three becomes the same as one over x to the three. Okay, so we travel we travel that exponent with that base. Okay, and then fractional exponents. Now this is going to come in handy a lot in our radical unit. Is taking something that has a fractional exponent and converting it into a radical. With that, um, if we have our exponent is like m over n the denominator n becomes the index and the numerator m becomes an exponent on that radical and you can write it either way inside or outside of the um, radical um, <coughs> the fraction or sorry the bracket but uh, depending on what you want to do with it is going to make a difference as to what you're going to do with that. And if we can see our example over here, x to the 2 thirds, again, the denominator becomes the index. So the 3 is the index. And the uh, numerator becomes the exponent on the x. And you can, again, write it either way. Depending on what you need to solve might determine whether or not you put it inside or outside of the bracket. Okay. Um, once we understand what a radical is, we use its definition to understand some of its properties. Radicals are similar to fractions. There's some general operations that can be made between all numbers. However, there are a specific subset of interactions that only occur when dealing with radicals. Uh, similar to fractions, radicals are a representation of a real number. It is often irrational. Therefore, it's not often simple to compare the magnitude of a radical. Like fractions, the form of radicals must be changed in order to make a visible comparison. So what we're going to do today in this lesson, we're going to review changing from uh, entire radicals to mixed radicals or from mixed radicals to entire radicals. And we're also going to do some comparison um, of radicals and how we might do that. And then we're going to talk about what happens when we have variables um, and what are the limits when we have variables under the radical? Because um, some, uh, because we're dealing with a radical, uh, we have limitations on what actually can be underneath that bracket. So let's start. If you want to go to the next page, page number two, we're going to convert entire radicals to mixed radicals. So let's remember what an entire radical is versus a mixed radical. Um, if you think about fractions, if you have an improper fraction like 14 over 3, an improper fraction, uh, we have a larger number in the numerator than the denominator. So we can simplify this into a mixed fraction. So by dividing 14 by 3, 3 goes into 14 uh, four times, and there are 2 left over. So it's similar to that, except in this case, we might have something under the radical that can be uh, taken out and written as a coefficient. Um, there's two different ways to do these, so I'm going to talk about uh, both of them and you can choose to do them either way. Um, I'm not going to do the example with both of them for necessarily all of them. I'm just going to talk about the fact that there are two methods, and it's really up to you as to using the one that is more convenient or to switch. I use different methods depending on how familiar I am with the number. Um, 
it, sometimes you're really familiar with, oh, I know that the factors of this are perfect squares, so I can do that. Um, and you can just take out the square roots of the perfect square factors, or you can do prime factorization and group um, to take things out. So first method is looking at your number and saying to yourself, are there any factors of that number that are perfect squares? So if I look at root 18, root 18 I know is the same as not root nine times two. And I know that nine is a perfect square. So I can take that out. Per the square root of nine is three. So if I take that out, it's root three, it's uh, three root two, and that's my answer. Now the other way I can do this is I could fi prime factorize. Maybe I don't know off the top of my head that nine is a factor of 18. So I could do, oh wait, okay, 18 is equal to two times three times three. And then when I prime factorized it, then I look for pairs. Looking there, I have a pair of threes. So I always say two underneath is worth one outside when you're dealing with square roots. So uh, I can take this and it would be three root two, okay? They're both methods that get you to the same answer and it really is depends on what you're most familiar with. Now, looking at the next one, uh, root 128, I'm not as familiar with it, but I did a little investigative work and looking at it, I re realized, oh, it's 16 times four times two. Well, 16 and four are perfect square roots. So I can write them as square root of 16 is four, square root of four is two, and I have my lonely little two left under my radical. So four times two is eight. So eight root two is my answer. You could also prime factorize that and then just circle pairs. You're gonna have a lot of twos and you would probably have about, hmm, I would say 17 twos. So that one might take a lot of work to do that. So for some things, it's easier to look for perfect squares and take them out that way. Now. When you're doing a cubed root, the difference there is instead of looking for a perfect square, you're looking for a perfect cube. We are not as familiar with that. We don't have as many of those memorized. But same kind of rule applies. We're going to look for sets now of three instead of sets of two. So if I expand this out, cubed root, 64, <clears throat> negative 64, is the same as negative four times negative four times negative four. Now, it's also negative two times 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 negative two, six negative twos. Um, actually, it's not though, because of the even odd numbers. Um, <clears throat> so that one, you kind of need the, the sets of three there. Um, and on the bottom, we have our three times three times three gives me 27. So again, I have my three factors identical that we're going to divide out. And we're going to, taking those out, I'm gonna have on the top negative four over three. Um, and you can write it like such, okay? Big difference between looking, uh, converting uh, the entire radical to mixed radical with a cubed root is that you're looking for sets of three, okay, as opposed to pairs. Um, going the other way is so much easier because basically you're just multiplying in. You're not having to do that factoring. So looking at the first one here, I'm going to, I have my two underneath. I'm gonna take my three in and it's a square root. So that means I'm multiplying it two times. So this would be equal to root 18. Over here, um, for b, I'm going to take my negative 2 in. So I'm going to have root 3 times negative 2 times negative 2, which is equal to, uh, when I multiply through, 12. And finally, here it's a cubed root. So I'm going to, when I take it in this times and 
have to multiply the 5 three times. So 3, 4 times 5 times 5 times 5. So when I multiply that through, I get 500. Okay, going from mixed to entire is way easier. The basic thing that you need to really remember is what is the index? Because if it's a cube root as opposed to a square root, or if it's a fourth root, etc., that's the number of times you need to multiply. Okay, now arranging in order from least to greatest, and it says no calculator, and I will get to that in a moment. So when we're comparing radicals, it can be kind of tricky. Um, because it's not easy for us to wrap our brain around a, a value for what that square root is when it uh, can't be simplified. Um, so what we have to do is we either have to have exactly the same value under the radical, like we do in the first one, or we have to change them all to um, entire radicals and compare that way. So looking at this first one, it's the easiest. All we do here is we look at what the coefficient is and we compare those. Because we know that the size of the pieces, the base piece is a cubed root of three. They all have that component to them, right? Like if we look, we've got cubed root of three, cubed root of three, cubed root of three. So it's really about that coefficient which tells us how many of them we have. So this one's straightforward and easy. So our smallest coefficient is 3. So 3 cubed root of 3 is our least. Our next smallest is 7. So 7 cubed root of 3 is next. And then the last one, 8 cubed root of 3. That one's easy because it's all the same size pieces, like we think about with fractions, right? Now the next one's not as easy because they're all different sizes under the radical. We have a 2 a six and a three. So what we're going to do is we're gonna change them all to entire radicals. So with the first one, this is going to be two times nine times nine, uh, which when we multiply that through, we'll get root 162. The next one will be six times two times two. When we multiply that through, we get 24. And the last one, we're going to get 3 times 8 times 8. So that would be root 192. Now we can compare them um, because we're looking at them just as entire radicals. Looking at that, it's just what is smallest. It's root 24, so that would be our smallest. So that would be 2 root 6. Next smallest is root 162. So that would be 9 root 2, and then 8 root 3 would be our next, our, our largest, okay? Now, I know it says up here, no calculator, but when we look at C, we hit a challenge. Because they are all different indexes, we can't really compare them. So when you have different indexes, you're going to have to use your calculator. Um, it's just the fact of life, <laughs> basically. I mean, you can do some estimation, but even doing estimation, you're going to need your calculator to do it. So for this one, you're going to want to put it in your calculator. Um, if you're not sure how to uh, find the cubed root, um, you can use your math button, and I believe it's uh, math and... Uh, the math button on your calculator and it will, it's option five, will, you can change the size of the index to evaluate them. When you use your calculator, so you guys can all check this at home, you get seven cubed root two is the smallest, then four root five, and then six fourth root five. Okay, so this one you will have to use a calculator okay there's no way otherwise D again we've got different size pieces under the radical so we're going to have to um, we're going to have to change them to uh, entire radicals and then compare them that way so here we're going to have and they're square roots so it's 5 times 3 times 3 which gives us root 45 
Here we're going to have 3 times 5 times 5, which is 75. And root 60 we leave as is because it's already an entire radical. Now looking at these, this one's my smallest, and then my 60, and then my root 75 is the largest. So if I put those in order, I have 3 root 5, then root 60, and then 5 root 3. Okay, so those are all my correct orders. Okay, um, you might have to do some conversion to get you there. Okay, ah, last page. It's a nice short little lesson today, getting us back in there. And hopefully it feels like a bit of review. Um, and I might put some extra review and practice questions, uh, pages in there from uh, exponents work that you did, would have done in 10C, just if you want to kind of brush up. Okay, here it says, determine when a radical is defined and for which values of variable is each radical defined. So what we have to think about is what values of our, value, of our, our variable will give us a real number because we cannot have a negative number under a square root. Okay, so first we're going to have to simplify these expressions. Now, when we look at our values, we're very good at getting things out from under the radical if they're numbers. We've talked about how to do that. We can do something similar when they are variables. So if I expand this out, this is the same as um, 2 times 3 times 3 times 3 times x times x times x. Now, thinking about when I talked about prime factorization, I basically just factored this using prime factorization. Now I'm going to circle pairs. And that's what I can take out from underneath the radical. I have a pair of threes there and a pair of x's there. So that means each of those are worth one outside of the bracket. So I can take that three out and I can take the x out. Now what's left over? I have two times three, which is six, and I have an x. Now, now looking at this, I have to think what value of x would this radical be defined? I need to know for what values of x will I have a positive number under the radical or zero. I can have a zero, that's fine. So I need to know what values of x will give me a positive, uh, sorry, a real number. So I want x, uh, x would have to be a positive number for me to get a positive value or it could be zero. So x would have to be greater than or equal to zero and x would be in the set of real numbers, okay? Um, so basically, I'm just looking for what values of x are not gonna give me a negative under that radical, okay? Now, it's a little different with cubed roots because with cubed roots, you can have a negative. But first, let's do our simplify, simplification. So again, I'm going to, I've got a cubed root here. I'm gonna prime factorize this. I have two times two, times three, and then I have x times x times x times x times x. Now, it's a cubed root, so instead of looking for pairs, I'm looking for sets of three. So all I can take out from underneath this one is an x. Still gonna simplify it, so I'll have x cubed root 12x squared. Now, it says for what value Will I have a real number? Because I can have a negative number under a cubed root, um, there is actually no limit to what x can be here. So x will just be in the set of real numbers. Okay? Um, I can have a negative number, it doesn't really matter. So I just, there's no limits in terms of what x could be to give me a real number. Uh, last one here. I have square root 75a squared, so let's factor this. This is 3 times 5 times 5 
times a times a. And I circle my pairs. I'm gonna take those out. So I'm gonna have five a outside and three underneath. Now, because there's no longer anything underneath there, um, a can be anything. A can be in the set of real numbers. And that would be my conclusion, okay? So that is our first lesson. Um, you can see down here at the bottom of the page, there are extra practice questions for you to do. These are in your workbook. Um, we're asking for work to be done for Friday. So what I'm hoping to do is that I can meet back on Friday if there's any questions. Feel free, however, to email me with questions um, and uh, I might be able to address them. Um, and I'm also looking at scanning the solution books for you guys uh, for your use. But this would be your work for this week. Um, and like I said, I'll also post some extra practice materials for you. You're welcome to work ahead if you like, if this is familiar for you. Um, I'm never going to stop somebody from working ahead if they want to. Thank you.